Welcome, welcome everyone to this session organized by JB Scholars Professional Development Forum. I'm Devarkya Sarkar or Devarkya Sarkar, and I'm, I recently graduated with my PhD from University of Southern California uh, in electrical engineering, and I'm currently a postdoc and a research fellow at Harvard University slash Massachusetts General Hospital. So that's just a bit about myself. But today's talk is by Professor uh, Subramaniam Anantakrishnan, and he'll be, he'll be talking to us about uh, how can we hear faint sounds in noisy space, essentially about radio astronomy and how India has contributed to that over the last uh, few decades. Briefly about him, although I'm sure most of us know a lot about him, but he is internationally and nationally known radio astronomer and radio scientist who uh, got his bachelor's and master's from Calcutta University and his PhD from TIFR and University of Bombay. He is of course a JB uh, NSDS scholar from the first batch 1960 and he was uh, deeply involved in the construction, commissioning and operation of major radio astronomy facilities such as the UTI radio telescope, the giant meter wave radio telescope, about which we'll hear from him very shortly. He is uh, he's an elected fellow of all major academies of India and across the world. And um, so on and so much more to say about him. So, you know, without further ado, I'll give it over to Professor Anantakrishnan. And uh, if you may Thank you. say a few words and start your uh, talk. Uh, thank you, Divorgya. Um, uh, before we start, let me say that uh, my talk today and the slides which I will be showing you are all thoroughly vetted by Devorgya and he took great pains to make them simpler and more lucid. So many thanks go to him first. Okay, and uh, his hard work. And I, of course, also thank my daughter, Dr. Revati Anantikrishnan, for her editorial help. So I will, uh, I will want to start with something. Uh, um, so it is a delight to talk to all the Jesibo scholars, including uh, batchmates from 1960 and others who will be listening in here. Uh, this is the, as I understood, this is the first inaugural talk of uh, in the JCPO Scholars Forum uh, by the uh, by the past scholars, uh, and of course uh, all through this is our 60 years since uh, since the JB University Scholarship has been present, and it is only appropriate that we pay homage to the great Acharya, namely Professor Jagadish Chandra Bose. An inventor par excellence, Professor Bose brought scientific temper to India. He may be legitimately considered as ushering in an era of experimental science into India, which was steep in theory, philosophical thoughts, and speculations over the previous centuries. Uh, as far as I know, he was the first uh, major experimental scientist that I was that was uh, sort of indigenous to India. And he made a fantastic amount of inventions. He invented the high frequency microwave directional couplers, attenuators, polarimeters. And these are out of uh, normal day-to-day -day things available, you know, like matchboxes and railway timetables and various things like that, and crystals. He also made the world's first horn antenna and transmission and reception of millimeter wave radio waves, which is the basis for 5G communication. And they have been realized in their modern form only decades later. You know, and Nobel laureate uh, Mott, in his uh, Nobel lecture, said that uh, Jagadish Chandra Bose was uh, too many decades ahead of his time. Now, when he was describing about semiconductor, uh, semiconductor discovery and physics and all that. 
And five G communications, as you know, is just yet to come. It's just coming. So the legacy goes back to uh, Bose's uh, transmission and reception of uh, millimeter wave, uh, uh, millimeter wave systems, communication systems. So therefore, we carry a great burden on our shoulders as JC Bose scholars to innovate similar useful devices in all uh, sciences and transform India into a developed country. So uh, the title was actually given by Gaborgya, not by me. I had just written uh, Indian contributions to radio astronomy and he changed it to a more sensible title of hearing faint sounds in noisy space. And uh, although it is not sound, it is some cosmic noise. And that cosmic noise uh, is what is the signal for a radio astronomer. And so we will go through all that uh, now. So uh, I have an introduction to make and uh, making of UT and GMRT telescopes, their performance and the science results and the grand panorama. So this was uh, Professor Bose. This is uh, uh, the transmitting and receiving antenna horn. Uh, which he displayed in 1897 in Delhi, in London. And uh, then in later years uh, on the left side, you can see the uh, photograph of uh, Venerable Sir Jesse Bose uh, in, in, the, in the years, probably around 1920 to 1930. He passed away in 1938 at the age of 80. And uh, he was a quintessential uh, radio scientist and probably a biophysicist too because he dealt with plants and other the with the sensitive reaction of plants to our touch and and various things about the plants and people are now working on those areas okay so we will talk about a subject that would have resonated very well with uh, Acharya J.C. Bose and namely radio astronomy that has come a long way. So we will discuss that first. And India has two very large radio telescopes. The first one completed in 1970 and the second one in uh, 2000. Both under the great personality of uh, Professor Gold Sarup of uh, JFR. I was involved deeply in both of them uh, from the beginning. And we'll describe briefly the, the UT telescope and then the GMRT and briefly the science being done and the future it holds uh, in that order. So this is a photograph of uh, Professor Saroop and I in um, May of 2019 in Pune. This was after his 90th birthday. Uh, but to our great shock, uh, he left us five days ago on 7th of September, uh, 2020. That is only Monday, last Monday. And we now have only his uh, memories to celebrate. In fact, I had received a mail from him on the previous week, to which I had answered. That was on 30th of August. And he said that he was having a minor illness and he hopes to get discharged from the hospital and that didn't happen. And so he passed away peacefully in his 91st year uh, and five months. And I think it's a great, great loss uh, to the nation because uh, I truly consider that uh, this, uh, after Jesse Bowles, the person who really brought a revolution to the Indian radio astronomy scene and radio science scene in India uh, was Gonsuru. Uh, of course, we had uh, very famous personalities like Shishir Kumar Mitra and uh, Dr. A.P. Mitra of uh, the National Physical Laboratory and uh, others. However, uh, I think Gobind's impact is going to be a phenomenal. Uh, because uh, as we will, we will see, uh, no one in, in India had uh, thought of such scales 
before, which will take India directly to the forefront of uh, astronomy and radio astronomy. And so today we are a nation right on top of the map. You know? At least this is an area where we have, we have made the more impacts than even China, which is of course catching up very fast. So we we'll go through the preliminaries. Uh, this is at a very basic level because uh, I am not sure how many people who are listening in are, are first of all physicists or electronics engineers. They may be from other areas of sciences, chemistry and all that. So I will start from the very beginning that uh, all of you are likely to have seen the night sky full of stars visible on the dark moonless night on some country roads at one time or another. We see a sky full of shining and shimmering stars, some planets, occasionally moving spacecraft, even more infrequently uh, meteorites uh, falling and uh, making a trace, transient trace in the sky and rarely the beautiful sight of comets. I had a fantastic uh, view of uh, the comet Ikea Seki in 1968 uh, when I was going from Kolkata to Chennai in those days by train. It, it passed through uh, Katak, I think, uh, early in the morning and there it was an all glory across the horizon. And that was a great thing. And since then, of course, I have done cometary research and all that. In the next uh, two slides, I show the deep sky image uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. These are optical pictures. Uh, but what we need to be aware of is also the presence in the sky of abandoned cosmic objects which are invisible to the eye. So a Hubble Space Telescope photograph, this shows us the sky is full of stars, of course, as well as collections of stars called the galaxies. And there is a, an arrow pointing to a, one of the galaxies uh, here, a distant galaxy, but if you get very close, this is a very big field of view, but uh, where you can see many galaxies and some bright stars. Uh, but in the next slide, we see only one of those galaxies. And you can see a beautiful spiral galaxy and the reason I have chosen this, uh, this galaxy, optical image of NGC 2997 and 4561, that is because uh, we, I will have more to tell about them in terms of a radio map of uh, one of these galaxies, 2997. We have made the other one also, but uh, time uh, prohibits me from doing all that. So the optical window through which we see these beautiful images is a very small part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So what is an electromagnetic spectrum? So the electromagnetic spectrum extends from very short wavelength uh, gamma rays to long wavelength radio waves. And of course, uh, we will uh, discuss Today only the large uh, radio window, but you can see here in this slide, which is an important slide, you can see on the left side uh, the, the uh, uh, telescopes which are sent above the atmosphere to catch gamma rays and X-rays and ultraviolet and all that. Because those rays are completely blocked by the atmosphere, uh, providing safety to for human evolution or animal evolution and tree, plants, everything. And if the atmosphere was not there, life would be impossible like on the moon. You know, to, to make a living on the moon, there's a separate issue. That's a big question. Will, will we ever, ever be able to do that? Although people are trying uh, various things. And next to that is the small, very small optical window which stretches from uh, something like 380 nanometer to 760 nanometer. And then there are a few small windows which are uh, infrared windows. And uh, the things like the 5G spectrum will be using some of those. And uh, then 
comes uh, the, the infrared spectrum, for example, again, this is absorbed mostly. And uh, there are telescopes which are now available for infrared, as well as ultraviolet and X rays and gamma ray telescopes. But we won't be talking of any of those things. We will talk only about the very broad radio window, which stretches from something like a few millimeters, uh, which are heavily attenuated, to a few tens of meters, uh, which is the uh, radio waves uh, where we can observe uh, cosmic objects from the Earth. And today's uh, talk is mostly concentrated on how we do this. And then again, at the very long wavelengths, uh, above, let us say, 15 or 20 meters, the atmosphere again blocks because the atmosphere becomes ionized by ultraviolet rays and therefore it, uh, it, it acts like a mirror. And so whatever you send comes back. And uh, this is how we do broadcasting. So uh, radio astronomy, just like optical astronomy and other astronomies, that too deals with the nature of the universe but uses radio waves as a tool to receive very weak signals emanating from the sun, the stars, the galaxies, objects like quasars and pulsars and magnetars and so on. Supernova remnants and all kinds of objects. Uh, radio waves are not of course sensitive to the human eye because of their large size and they are detected using radio receivers. Uh, it all began with Carl Zansky of the Bell Labs and um, and he uh, enlarge the screen. Uh, and he was asked by the uh, Bell Labs to investigate uh, various hissing noises which were coming from from the radio equipment which they were building. And so Jansky set up this antenna, which you can see in the slide. And uh, this was working at uh, about 20 megahertz. And then he was, uh, he recorded the data. And so he was hearing and he put on a, uh, put on a microphone and a speaker and all that. And, uh, and he was listening into the noise. Uh, we talked about the noise, uh, radio noise coming from the cosmic sky in the beginning. And so he was hearing a lot of noise. But there was, uh, he was a good engineer, I should say. He heard a noise which seemed to rise and fall in one part of the day, he said. And uh, this, is, uh, this shows the kind of signal which he was getting. And being a clever engineer, he timed it. And he saw that it was, uh, the period between the uh, between the peaks which you see in this figure are uh, 23 hours 56 minutes and four seconds and that was amazing and he he didn't know what it was because he had uh, he had no inkling of astronomy but it so chanced that when he was in the library searching through various books he met an astronomer uh, from the Bell labs i think and uh, who told him that, no, this is a sidereal day. This is the time a, a star or any cosmic object takes to come back to the same place uh, where it was recorded earlier. So from if you focus on any star and you go from day to day, you will find that the star comes at 23 hours, 56 minutes and four seconds and not 24 hours, because that is the that is the time by which the Earth moves forward uh, around the Sun. So that is about roughly a degree. Uh, you know, degree is four minutes of time, and so degree in the sky is a four minutes of time, and so that's why it's a little less than the four minutes of time, and that's why he got that. And therefore, for the first time, Jansky found that he was receiving signals from an extraterrestrial object. And it took quite some time 
to find out that this is the direction of the center of the galaxy, Milky Way galaxy. So that was a great discovery. And, uh, but then Bell Labs was not very interested in, in this kind of research. They were making money. And so they asked him to get out of this and go back to his uh, work in radio. Um, so there was this uh, amateur radio engineer, Grote Reber. He took off from where Jansky left and he was a radio engineer, clever radio engineer again. And he built a radio telescope in his backyard, which is what you see in this figure. Uh, this is kept in uh, one of the radio astronomy observatories, I think in Narevo. And he made a map of the sky at a much higher frequency, at 160 megahertz, a megahertz being million cycles uh, per second wavelength uh, frequency. And uh, therefore, it is a, a shorter wavelength and 480 megahertz. And those are the maps in the, in the inset. And this was during the 1938-1943. And he published this, uh, published this information. He was a completely amateur, self-made radio engineer who did all this. And Grote River was a fantastic fellow. He, he later on uh, settled in, I think, Tasmania on New Zealand. And there is a Grote River medal today of the International Radio Science Union, which goes through uh, court. Um, so in the next slide, we see the, the preliminary uh, things of a radio telescope. So this is a parabolic dish. All that it does is to focus the uh, uh, radio waves from a distant celestial source, a radio source, which are of course, because they are at infinite distance, they are parallel waves coming in. Although here it shows us a divergent, uh, divergent arrows. Uh, but they are parallel waves which are coming and therefore they focus on a on what's called a primary uh, focal point. And you can do two things. Either you can receive the uh, radio waves directly there by putting a dipole or a horn antenna about which we talked. Or we can put a small reflector there and focus it down to the uh, down to the yoke of the antenna, where you can put the field horn. Uh, and we have, we have discussed horn being invented by uh, J.C. Bose. So this is what enables the uh, signals to be uh, collected together, finally. And what this parabolic dish does is to collect a large amount of, uh, large amount of such very, very weak signals. And since they are all collected together, it is like drops of water in a huge bucket. And then, so therefore, uh, depending on how much of uh, signals which you collect, so you will get a centimeter of water at the bottom of the tub, or you will get a, you will get a 50 centimeter of water in the tub. So that is corresponding to the very weak intensity or the strong intensity being emitted by the radio source. And this is now an electrical uh, signal and it's all converted into electrical voltages, really speaking, because after all, they are uh, carrying electrons, which produce uh, voltage. And so the voltage which is received is what is recorded. And one of which you saw in Jansky's uh, chart recorder. Uh, today, uh, we, when we started in the UT telescope, we were uh, we were uh, uh, we were recording it in the chart recorder. But afterwards, we we changed over to computer and computer and other digital recording devices. So a simple radio telescope consists of a, a radio receiver, a steerable antenna, which can go in all directions, and then an amplifier and detector, and then a recording computer. So the basic point here is that the angular resolution of any radio telescope is wavelength divided by the aperture of the telescope. This is true of all collections 
whether it is optical or infrared or radio. So in the case of even a 10 centimeter optical telescope, if you calculate lambda is of the order of 500 nanometer and G is of the order of 10 centimeter optical telescope, a very small optical telescope, even then you will find that the theta is a very small number because the wavelength is very small. But if you put a 45 meter parabolic dish antenna, such as the GMRT, it gives only a resolution of 1.2 degrees in the sky, which is much, much larger than uh, one second of arc because a degree of uh, angle in the sky is has to be multiplied by 60 by 60, 3600 to get seconds of arc. And so this is worse by uh, 4000 times. So really, if you want to look at these objects in the sky, you have to get very fine resolutions. And therefore, to get one arc second resolution, as shown at the bottom, at a wavelength of one meter, you need really a aperture of about 200 kilometers. So this is, uh, this is very impractical. But large telescopes have been built, including the GMRT, which we will come to, or the UT radio telescope, which are sufficiently big, so you will get some resolution, some minutes of arc, and things like that. But you do need uh, to go to the seconds of arc, so we will come to that. Uh, and the, so we started off with the first one. We started with UT in, uh, in the Neil Graves, uh, to which some of you may have uh, gone. And visited is a very picturesque place. And then we also put up this very large uh, radio telescope array, GMRT, later. So one was built in 1970, the other was built in uh, 2000. And so one is in Tamil Nadu, uh, Karnataka border, and the other is in Maharashtra, uh, close to uh, Pune and east of Bombay. Mm. So we, we come to uh, the UT radio telescope. So ORT is a very innovative parabolic cylinder that is actually half a kilometer long. Now, we didn't become 200 kilometers, but at least we are talking in terms of kilometers now. <laughs> so half a kilometer long and 30 meter wide, it is placed on a north-south hill slope, which is the same as the latitude of uh, UT, and it was commissioned in uh, early 1970. So UT has a latitude of 11 degrees uh, from the equator. And as you know, the North Pole you see as being directly above the axis of the Earth, so which means that the equator is 90 degrees away from the North Pole. And so on the equator, if you lie, on, lie down on the horizon, you will see the North Pole. But as you go towards the poles, the North Star will be keeping on rising above the, above the uh, horizon. And so uh, we learned in, in uh, past class in mathematics that the altitude of the uh, pole is the same as the latitude of the place, uh, a very simple geometrical equation. And going through, got this fantastic idea sitting in the Tata Institute of Phenomenal Research Library that if we could find a hill which is equal to the latitude of that place, then he could put simply a telescope on the hill slope and the axis of the telescope will become parallel to the Earth's axis. And that's exactly what has been done. To make a long story short, he finally found, he surveyed the whole of uh, South India along with uh, his, uh, his Shishya Ramesh Sinha. And uh, he found this place in 1965. It was sort of settled, it was approved. Uh, Professor Bhava came and inspected the site many times and finally he gave approval. And then we, we get this uh, ingenious uh, radio telescope. The big advantage of doing this is because you might ask, why did he do this? Why did he take all this trouble? The big advantage is that he was 
always after being a great uh, indigenous innovator he knew the limitations in india and he was always uh, even from 1950s he was always after low cost but large scientific instruments with which he can do first rate research and so it is in that process that he uh, hit on this idea that if we could place a large parabolic cylinder instead of a dish then it rotates only in one direction now you can see the uh, the ut radio telescope in all its glory on the inset is the is the telescope on the slope of a hill which is pretty sleek is uh, steep but it is 11 degrees uh, uh, 23 minutes in latitude and therefore the slope is also 11 degrees 23 minutes and so at the end of the axis of the telescope lies the pole star and uh, so this place was very accurately uh, chosen to theodolite measurements and this was placed and in fact when i went to the site in 1968 there was nothing only the earth earth was being moved and things were happening there and in the matter of next two years this whole edifice was put up and we had built the electronics in the tfr and we took all that electronics to ut and we set it up in that place and i built uh, with the help of uh, bark engineers i built a uh, uh, servo system for tracking this telescope and so this telescope is what uh, what is there it is still working 50 years uh, since its uh, inauguration in 1970 february 18 we had a celebration 2020 uh, of the 50th year of the telescope and you can see that the telescope is actually consisting with where is the telescope you might ask the telescope consists of only uh, 1100 stainless steel wires and you can barely see this in the slide which is uh, sun's reflection on the telescope okay sun is shining on the parabolic mirror a little bit to the right and you can see its reflection on the wires at least part of the wires and so there is a white the white strip from from below to up and uh, next to the parabolic frame the last parabolic frame that you can see in this picture and that tells you the wires which have been drawn so these wires act as the reflector and that is the whole beauty of this instrument because uh, as you see on the left side the wavelength is 92 cm 327 and megahertz which is the deuterium uh, line hydrogen line so one should have thought that he will be able to discover the uh, 92 cm uh, deuterium line which is far far less than the neutral hydrogen line which is 1420 uh, so that that took a very long time to to <laughs> to come out uh, that's a different story so the a telescope it, it behaves like a uh, behaves like a collector uh, of radio source large collector of radio source the the telescope can be rotated completely from east to west mechanically as you can see here the whole uh, uh, the primary feed is uh, is hanging on onto this uh, extension from the parabolic frame and that is uh, there are uh, 1100 uh, dipoles there okay and uh, no i think there were 1042 dipoles originally probably it was 1100 finally there are 1042 dipoles which can be switched using uh, diode phase shifters the original phase shifters which were mechanical uh, they were uh, very poor uh, in terms of functioning and so they were removed and replaced by uh, by the engineers in in the ut telescope uh, group and this diode phase shifter with the diode phase shifter we are able to switch the beam uh, across the sky in the north south direction which is the declination uh, in astronomical parlance 
and in the hour angle or the right ascension direction from east to west all that the telescope does is to cancel the movement of the earth so that it can track any object in the sky and this was very effectively used uh, by uh, gonsurub and all of us to study various uh, objects and he and uh, uh, his first student professor vijay kapahi uh, they in fact showed that they can support the a, a big bang cosmological model and we don't have time to go through all that uh, but we will just say that uh, it was a great big result from the uti radio telescope in the initial days it was also used by uh, myself and others for uh, other experiments like interplanetary scintillation and pulsars and all that so the next slide Uh, we we just uh, we just mentioned that it has been extensively used uh, for pulsar observations and study of extragalactic radio sources and the solar wind medium uh, by the interplanetary scintillation technique. To a man, more than 500, 600 research papers have been produced, and it has been now fitted with a new backend. And the amplifiers which we built are still working there. and but it has been all uh, the recording has all been digitized in more efficient manner and so the telescope is uh, again useful for the next several years now we go to the next uh, topic we talked about a single dish uh, radio telescope but we said that to get one arc second resolution at a wavelength of 1 meter uh, we need some 200 km so how do we get a much higher resolution telescope because even uti telescope uh could not do that except by using the lunar occultation principle where it it uh, the moon was used as a disk to discover radio sources which is what uh, god sir did and which was uh, which was a fantastic uh, thing to do but we needed to go to all parts of the sky because the moon does not cover the whole sky and so therefore it was decided that we needed to go further and so we did lots of things in between we built a synthesis interferometer and then we talked of uh, putting a giant telescope in the equator uh, similar to the uti telescope but 2 kilometers long and 50 meters wide having a billion square kilometer million square meter of uh, collecting area and so these things uh, were all going on and and in all this uh, we felt finally that it, what was important was to develop technology within india and have a, a radio telescope facility which is comparable to the best in the world and and therefore we go back and for obtaining high angular resolution scientists use what are called radio interferometers which are simply the counterpart of uh, the michelson optical interferometer uh, about which uh, those people who have done a physics course would be very familiar because there are laboratory experiments talking about young slit experiments and secondary waves wavelets and all that in our bsc classes and then further in the in the in the master of science classes uh, people learn about the velocity of light uh, uh, and things like that so corresponding thing in the radio domain is called a radio interferometer so the trick is to keep two such uh, parabolic dishes Uh, side by side or any collecting dishes uh, side by side separated by now a large uh, large length which is much more than the diameter of the uh, parabolic dish itself as an example if it is a parabolic cylinder then it has to be much larger than the parabolic cylinder dimensions in in north south or the east west direction so uh if you have two telescopes like this receiving radio waves you can see that at the center they will be received in phase there is no issue 
But if you were rotating the telescopes, then you will have to correspondingly, if it was the telescopes were looking at the vertical direction, zenith, then you don't need to do anything else. You can collect this signal, like in an optical uh, setup, uh, monochromatic uh, sodium lamp, then split it by two slits and then combine them. You can see in the far, far away screen, uh, fringes, light and dark fringes. And exactly similarly, you can see at the smallest inset here on the right hand side bottom, you can see fringes there and they are the radio fringes. Um, there is an intensity versus time graph there and that shows the radio fringes. And so uh, what this interferometer does is that it uses this baseline, lambda by D, where D is no longer the aperture of the uh, dish, but it is the uh, it is the distance between the two parabolic frames. And so that is what gives you a much larger D. And now the principle can be extended very much more. Now you can have kilometers long uh, cables and still combine them provided you can use a phase shifter to correctly phase the two signals which are coming in. And in radio, it is much easier to do this than an optical case. So therefore, Optical interferometers uh, could be made only much, much later, many, many decades later, only more recently, uh, they could be made because there the precision which is required is extremely high because we are talking in terms of nanometers. Here you are uh, talking in terms of either uh, meter or centimeter at the most uh, fractions of centimeter, so which are, which are much easier to handle in terms of building the electronics. So basically in mathematical terms, an interferometer measures one Fourier component of the radio image. And so uh, to synthesize telescopes of larger size, many individual dishes are spread out over a large area on the earth and signals from such array telescopes are combined and processed to generate a radio image of the source structure, which is the cosmic radio source by the principle of interferometry. So the angular resolution is again lambda by D, but D is the largest separation between the antennas and not the aperture of the antenna. So therefore the D becomes very long. And imagine yourself that if you were able to put a telescope on the earth and on an orbiting platform, uh, like what was built much later in 2011 in, uh, by Russia, on which a GMRT payload was also put, antenna was, uh, horn was put uh, with an amplifier. And uh, this was the, the orbiting antenna at about 300,000 kilometers. So lambda by D became well, the wavelength divided by 300,000 kilometers. And so you can see that the, now you can see much better than an arc second. So you can go even to milliard seconds or even more by this process. So that is a, a very interesting thought. This uh, was proposed by Professor Martin Ryle of Cambridge. He showed how to combine signals from different antenna baselines and synthesize a large aperture to get uh, high resolutions in, in the late 60s and early 70s. And so here you see uh, the great uh, idea introduced by uh, Martin Rail, who got a Nobel Prize in 1974 for this. He introduced the concept of earth rotation for synthesizing apertures. So he said that although the baseline may be X or D, capital D, now as the earth rotates, the sky, projection shortens it down to the very bare one aperture. As you can see in this figure, there are two antennas which are located, they are east-west. And so as the earth rotates, these antennas become 90 degrees uh, positioned. 
And so now you see the baseline has been completely shortened. So as you shorten the uh, shorten the uh, aperture, the effective aperture, the resolution becomes poorer and poorer. But you can use this idea to uh, map or radio image a large object to a very small object. Now you can extend this idea much further. You can have many dishes like this in the north zone direction, in the east west direction, and as the Earth rotates, they will all make different uh, Ds, and so you can get instantaneously you can get baselines which are uh, from the smallest to the largest separation of these antennas, and this is the principle of uh, synthesizing apertures by earth rotation principle and Ryle showed that when he observed a galaxy, uh, a famous galaxy Cygnus A, uh, he saw not just the central optical image which coincides with a small radio source but two big blobs of uh, radio signals and they were, uh, they were much more intense than the central object and this was absolutely amazing and there goes the whole discovery of uh, you know double radio galaxies and active galactic nuclei and the entire uh, you know <laughs> the entire uh, box was pandora's box was opened for radio astronomers and uh, that is how uh, lots of fantastic work has been has been done using radio astronomy. So the, 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 it was shown later by a, even a better picture by the very large array uh, in New Mexico in the United States, uh, which preceded uh, GMRT, that, uh, that there are jets which are going from the central object. There is an active galactic nucleus and it is emitting jets of radio waves, plasma, which is uh, which is uh, plunging through the uh, the cosmic media and creating hot spots at the end because of shock waves and you see the black spots here which are the shock waves as a result of this and they are called the double radio source hot spots and uh, so the giant meter wave radio telescope is a mammoth earth rotation apparatus and this is instrument for studying astrophysical phenomena at low radio frequencies of 40 to 1450 megahertz. This was built in India by uh, the National Center for Radio Astrophysics in Pune, uh, which is a part of uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research as a national project at a low cost of about 15 million US dollars in 1992. And this array telescope consists of 30 novel low cost dish antennas of 45 meters diameter, each operating at meter wavelengths, and it is the most powerful synthesis array in the world at these frequencies even today. So we have published papers and all that, and uh, let me go to the array itself and see the antenna. And so you can see this, uh, the great big radio telescope which has been built. I just want you to focus on these frames the parabolic frames that you see here, stretching like bicycle spokes from the center, you will recall that the Uti telescope looks exactly like this. If you cut it in the middle and you take only one half of that. So the idea came from there, that why cannot you put this together and create a mesh surface by an ingenious way of combining these frames and keeping them in place. And there is, of course, an outer ring, which is a stabilizing uh, ring frame, which is uh, keeping them all together in place. But there are cables which you can see, which are called rope trusses, which are uh, pulling all these things using turnbuckles. And so everything is taught there. And so this forms a basic parabolic frame. It is not yet a parabola, but it forms a parabolic frame and on which you can put uh, a mesh surface of stainless steel wires, which will form the mirror surface. 
And because the steel steel wire mesh is very small, uh, say one centimeter by one centimeter or two centimeter by two centimeter or less, that is sufficient to receive radio waves up to about 1400, 1450 megahertz. And then the efficiency drops off uh, very rapidly because of uh, ground spill, because all the radio waves pass through it then. Because it is like uh, looking at a sheet of paper, and we do not see the holes in this paper. But if you put this paper under the uh, under an atomic microscope or something, you will find that it is full of holes. But we cannot see it because it is much less than what our uh, eyes can uh, eyes are sensitive to. So in the same manner, here also you the radio waves will not see any hole here generally. The, the, the ground leakage will be very small. That depends upon the mesh hole size to the uh, wavelength at which you are wanting to operate. So if you have got, let us say, a two centimeter by two centimeter hole, you can obviously operate it uh, uh, 10 times this uh, hole size wavelength. And that corresponds to 20 centimeter, which is 1400 uh, megahertz approximately. So that is the principle of the uh, GMRT and the location had to be found and that was a big story in itself. I will not go through that, all that story. We searched all over South India. We wanted to be as close to the equator as possible because we can see both the northern sky and southern sky uh, fully, but uh, there is uh, something called an equatorial electrojet there in the atmosphere which is a powerful jet and which scatters radio waves and so we have to go to north of the uh, north of the equatorial jet and so we located the telescope finally after a lot of search uh, 70 kilometers north of Pune and 160 kilometers east of Mumbai and the latitude 19 degrees north and 74 degrees east approximately. This slide shows how the GMRT antennas are spread over following the principle of synthesis uh, uh, telescopes. You can locate the antennas on a, either a uh, Y array or it can be uh, it can be east west, which is disadvantageous in many ways. I will not go into that. But as the Earth rotates, these antennas make nice patterns and make uh, very good images. And the idea was to produce a central compact array, which can be used for large angular size objects and the three arms of the Y array, which can make very high resolution pictures, going up to about uh, 10 arc seconds in 327 megahertz and one arc second at 1400 megahertz. The total extent of this is uh, uh, 14 kilometer, uh, 14 kilometer arms. But if you see end to end between one end of the arm dish and the other end of the southern dish uh, and the far end of the western or eastern dish, you will find that it makes it into a uh, 25 kilometer a diameter circle. And so you have basically increased the resolution of the telescope from an aperture of 45 meters to 25 kilometers. And that is what gives you a highly uh, high resolution beam with which you can make, make pictures of the cosmic objects. And so this hybrid configuration is very unique. And in fact, it is being used now, even in the square kilometer array, which uh, we will talk at the end. So it helps in producing high and low, low resolution images. So these are pictures that we will follow. Uh, uh, this is a bird's eye view, a closer view of the central array of the GMRT. And this is zooming in on one uh, single antenna from a nearby hill. You can see villages uh, nearby, and so one has to be very, very careful about uh, uh, careful about locating these antennas because we want to keep the 
uh, radio frequency interference to the minimum and we spent a great deal of effort uh, persuading the government of Maharashtra to provide uh, uh, provide safety to us by keeping away the industries and welding generators and arcs and various other things. So only small industries can come up in this area uh, at least of about three kilometers or four kilometers around GMRD. And uh, the, the villagers uh, around the place, they were all very helpful and uh, they helped us uh, build this uh, large telescope with our engineers and scientists and technicians and all that. We'll come to that now. And so the dish has 16 parabolic frames which give the basic shape and the reflecting surface consists of a stretched mesh which is attached to these rope trusses. And the wire mesh is matched to the large wavelength of operation as we discussed. And that is how the parabolic frame is made. Uh, you can see how this parabolic frame is and the central uh, uh, central thing which you see are the are these ropes which are steel steel ropes which are kept there to combine one dish to the other one parabolic frame to the other parabolic frame and then you can see a faint strip there which shows again the mesh just like we saw in the UT telescope so that is the uh, that is the <laughs> strip which shows the reflection of uh, so as uh, uh, Gonsuru used to joke uh, this is a see-through uh, mesh so you can see the sky at night through the telescope in the next slide I show you briefly the the construction of this telescope the construction of the telescope was, uh, was an ingenious uh, way the basic structure on the concrete is made and on top of the yoke is a called item called yoke, which is going to hold these frames. And uh, you can see the, the various paraphernalia there. And the left hand uh, uh, bottom, you see a slide which I'm going to expand in the next one. But in the next one, we have lifted up this telescope up there. And then in the last slide at the bottom is the fully turning uh, telescope. It was as simple as that. It could be just all erected in one day by purely human labor and with a little bit of aid from the cranes. In the next slide, you will see how. You see, this is how the radio telescope was built. It was built around this hub at every place. The uh, concrete structure was there. And around that, these frames were all put. It was, the whole thing was very ingenious. And the last portion of this reflecting mesh will be done at the, at the top later. But the, the frames were such that through the hole, you could lift this whole thing up. And you can see the, uh, see the uh, frames also, which are holding the, uh, holding the primary focus, which you will see in the next slide later. But important thing which I want you to see in this slide is the guys who are standing at the bottom. They are all uh, technical workers who are going to pull up this antenna up to the top by using simple pulleys. And a, a mystery, a supervisor who was whistling and everybody resonated with the whistle there were four pulleys and four sets of people were rotating the pulley simultaneously, resonating with each other, otherwise the dish will oscillate. So they were moving uh, inch by inch up. And so at the end, they have just moved a little bit here. Uh, at the end, this uh, whole dish is at the top. And this was all done with just hands, labor. And this is impossible to do in any other country than in India, perhaps in China. But uh, Chinese had not learned all these tricks at that time. <laughs> See, today, of course, there are missionaries which can do that. But even now, uh, lifting a 45 meter dish antenna like this is uh, an absolute innovation, I would say. So everything about GMRT is innovative, indigenous, 
and low cost. And that's why it's a very lightweight steel structure. Uh, you can see the full structure, which is rotating, and whose primary focus is, this is not a Cassegrain focus, as we saw right in the beginning here, parabolic dish, uh, which was a sketch, but this is a prime focus dish, where the, the prime focus contains the uh, feed elements, which are dipoles, horns, and so on. So, you can see here, there is a crane, and the crane is uh, lifting people up there. This is a two meter by one and a half meter platform, I think, up there. This is about 90 feet high. And you stand there and you fix all these uh, feeds. It is, uh, it is quite, a, quite a feat. <laughs> when you go up there, you feel that there is no ground below you and there's only a charge of 90 feet. And so it is, uh, it is somewhat scary for the first time goers. So some students were lifted up there. Uh, some, some of the people got so scared that they, they were crying. So this was, uh, this was very interesting. And so we learned to do all these things, the indigenous uh, labor, technical help. Of course, uh, many experienced engineers of the group who had built the Uti telescope came here, trained others, and we had a fantastic uh, mechanical engineer, project engineer, Mr. Tapre, who, who did all that, uh, who managed all this mechanical uh, systems of the antenna. And so with everyone's help, the electronics was uh, built by the basic team, which came from GMRT, very experienced engineers, and uh, then they, of course, trained many, many other engineers, new engineers who were bright and who learned very fast. And so we had an entire team working on these things. Compared to Uti, where only a few of us were there to build all the things, and uh, probably about 20, 25 people who built all the things, here we were talking in terms of hundreds of people. And it was a massive project really by any, any standard. However, the cost of these antennas were astonishingly low. And each antenna in those days cost only about 35 lakhs or 40 lakhs or something like that. Today it will cost you uh, several crores, probably about 10 crores for each antenna. Because the labor cost has gone up high and uh, the sophistication has increased and so on and so forth. So the operating frequencies of GMRT are uh, uh, this, uh, to begin with, they were narrow ranges, um, 40 to 60 megahertz and 120 to 180 megahertz. And in fact, the first one was not there. Uh, then 225 to 245 megahertz and 300 to 360 and 580 to 650 megahertz, 1000 to 1430 megahertz. So the antenna primary feeds are placed on a rotating turret near the focus of the 45 meter dishes. And so you could rotate any of these fields uh, as shown here. So this is how you could rotate from one position to another position. And the bottom most was looking towards the parabolic dish and collecting all the signals at that frequency range. So these quadrupod legs which are holding this we're also holding the mechanical rotation uh, using, uh, using a drive, a servo drive. Uh, uh, I think it is a DC motor. And uh, it rotated from one place to another place by 90 degrees, exactly. And so those were uh, counted, taken care of and all that. So it was precise, fairly precise, to put the dish, uh, put the feed in the right place. Okay, this is only the end of the thing. It was a great nostalgic moment for us. Uh, the giant meter wave radio telescope was dedicated to the world scientific community by the chairman of the Institute Council, Mr. Ratan Tata in 2001. And you can see several uh, persons here, including me, Professor Jha on the right hand side, Professor Rajaram Nityananda, Professor G. Srinivas in the background. And it was a great, uh, great thing. 
and it was dedicated on October 4, 2001. And uh, now many years have gone by, 20 years have gone by. And so in the next slide, I show you the, uh, of course, the GMRT range of science was very, very large. It's a very powerful instrument to probe several astrophysical objects and phenomena like the sun, the extrasolar planet, pulsars, supernova remnants, other explosive events like gamma ray bursts and magnetars, and ionized and neutral hydrogen gas clouds or galaxy and other galaxies, radio properties of different kinds of galaxies and galaxy clusters, radio galaxies at large distances in the universe, and cosmology and the epoch of reionization. Now, each of these topics will require, you know, uh, many, many tens of minutes or at least even hours. And so many new interesting results have been produced in the last 17 years or so. And roughly about 50 to 60 papers have been produced uh, per year based on the GMRT data. And uh, so GMRT can uh, typically observe the sun in a snapshot mode. But the problem with GMRT is that it is too big. It is not small. To observe the sun, which is a large object in the sky, you don't need such a large instrument. You need small dishes. You don't need large dishes. So large dishes are a disadvantage to map the sun. But what you can do is for a reasonably complex sun, you can uh, recover the, the large scale structure. You can recover for frequencies below 325 megahertz, where the primary beam is wide enough, which has poor resolution. But for higher dissymmetric images, the higher resolution, uh, it acts like a true interferometer. It smears out large objects. In an interferometer, optical interferometer too, you cannot uh, look at a large object in the sky using an interferometer. It gets smeared out. There are no fringes from a large object. It's only from a very small object, point-like object. So that is why we use the term monochromatic point source and even in optics, you know, a sodium vapor lamp or something like that. So this is uh, the pictures on the left are not from uh, GMRT, but they are pictures of the sun where you can see that the radio image is much larger than the, uh, the normal optical image which you see from the sky. And the top left is the uh, meter wavelength uh, array, which is their Murchison wild field array, uh, which is there in Australia, and on which uh, the team from GMRT of uh, Professor Divya Oberoi and his students have worked. The MWA came very recently, some five, six years ago. And Divya was involved in uh, many of its uh, uh, instrumentation activities. And he has observed, uh, here you can see a 150 megahertz type two solar burst from the sun, a very compact region. And uh, when the sun is very quiet, you can make, make a map, which uh, Divya and his students, they have all made, and which has been published only last year. But GMRD is not quite suitable for these things. So where we show GMRD pictures, the GMRD observes various pointed sources on the sun. And so you can hardly see the sun. There is, I do not know whether you see a faint circle uh, around in the photograph. And that circle represents the optical image of the sun. And within that, you see some hot spots. And those are the radio spots which are very active. And so this is a noise storm observations which we made in 2005 or 2006. And uh, using a interferometer visibilities from a NASA interferometer in France and the GMRT. And so the, the dense uh, short baseline coverage was required of the NASA instruments uh, combined with the long baseline coverage of GMRT, it provided very high quality snapshot images at 327 megahertz. And the resolution was quite high, it was 50 arc seconds. And uh, it produced a good map.
which was of course published in all that. So that is about the sun, and so we will go on to the next one, uh, finding new pulsars. So new pulsar, pulsars were discovered in, uh, in UT also, but they were few in number uh, because of its limited steerability and, and all that. And it was primarily an occultation instrument, uh, occultation uh, uh, discovery instrument. And so pulsar time was much less. And so nowadays it is being used more. But um, GMRD was a very suitable pulsar machine. And so it has been discovering a number of uh, new pulsars. Pulsars are rotating neutron stars, uh, which at the end of a, end of a star's life, uh, it gets uh, collapsing, it, it collapses, gravitational collapses and becomes a very small object, but highly, uh, with a very high magnetic fields and very high gravity, okay? So it is a gram of uh, a neutron star would probably weigh millions of tons, or at least uh, several tens of thousands of tons. And so these objects rotate, they preserve the original angular momentum and they rotate and therefore they also emit their uh, magnetic fields interact with uh, their own electric fields and produce jets of uh, pulses and uh, jets of radio waves basically, but whenever these radio waves are looking in our direction, we get a pulse of uh, pulse of uh, radio signal, uh, much like a light uh, lighthouse, uh, rotating lighthouse, where you see, and then it disappears and then comes back again after some period. So the beauty is that the, the period between the two pulses is extremely precise. This is, uh, the, it contains all those informations in the slide, but this is very small, but you can probably make out that it goes down to about uh, 10 digits or so in decimal places. At the, at the top, uh, these are shown, these data are shown. And so this, this was a new discovery of a pulsar in a globular cluster where pulsars are thought to be numerous, and this was done by uh, Professor Yashwan Gupta and his colleagues, uh, Scott Frere, uh, Scott Ransom and Ishwar Chandra and Frere and others. It, it turned out to be a binary pulsars with high eccentricity. And uh, so there are these, uh, there was a, this discovery paper later. And the next slide shows the early GMRD discovery of a new pulsar and the supernova remnant so uh, whose image is taken with Chandra telescope, X-ray telescope is also shown in the, in, the, in the top panel. That is an X-ray image at the top and the radio image is at the bottom. So this pulsar is close to the center of the uh, supernova. Uh, it has about 62 millisecond period. Okay, very rapid. So we need a very rapid recording system and the age of this was uh, 4,900 years. Uh, pulsar, uh, that is uh, the, the neutron star by when, that, when the star collapsed. That was 4,900 years ago. Uh, so uh, th such discoveries have continued to be made, but we came to a stage and we also show, uh, so we are going from sun to a galaxy where the pulsars are located, our galaxy and to external galaxies. In the next slide, uh, in the next slide we have a, a radio map from a GMRT. I showed you the optical photograph of this in the, in the initial slides of NGC 2997. It's a very interesting galaxy. There is no time to go through that. But you can see the contours of radio superposed on the spiral. You can see the optical photograph is inside which is pink in color, and the radio photograph is superposed on top of that. So you can see that they are linked together, and these are magnetic field uh, emitting regions, and the radio uh, magnetic uh, fields, electrons rotating in magnetic fields give rise to synchrotron radiation, and that is how these uh, 
radio contours get generated and these were done um, by the GMRD. In the, in the next slide, we should very rapidly go through this. A collage of uh, many, many galaxies. There are 60 galaxies in this slide. And this is a collage built up by uh, Amitesh Homer, uh, who is at present at uh, Nainital. Uh, he is building backends for the optical telescope. There, he was a radio astronomer to begin with. Graduated from the Raman Research Institute in Bangalore. And this is a, a beautiful uh, group of galaxies in the Eridanus group of galaxies. A prominent group at a distance of about 23 megaparsecs and the extent is 20 megaparsecs. Now, we are talking in terms of megaparsecs. Parsec is uh, 3.2 light years and you know how much is the distance of a light year which is uh, 6 trillion miles which is uh, 10 trillion kilometers and we are talking in terms of 20 million into that 3.28 so some 60 70 uh, million 70 million light years away from here and so this is a very distant group of galaxies and so this is these are the wonderful things which have been possible uh, with the setting up of the GMRT, so it became a very uh, branded instrument all across the world. And so the time was ripened by 2010 to upgrade GMRT to a new uh, sophisticated electronic system, which was undertaken by Professor Yashwan Gupta and his uh, team of engineers and scientists uh, from NCRA. And so we'll talk about a little bit about that in this next slide set of slides. Uh, so the next generation of uh, upgraded GMRT, what is called the UGMRT, was done during the years 2012-2018, completed a major upgrade, which has increased the bandwidth. It increased the bandwidth. So now almost seamless coverage from going from about 120 megahertz to 1450 megahertz could be done. And now the bandwidth was not 32 megahertz as per the original uh, original legacy instrument, which you can see in the small squares, and the, in the white squares inside the pink uh, rectangles, uh, there are these small ones, and those were the original GMRT about which we talked. And now we are talking of this huge bandwidth uh, instrument, and the noise uh, which is coming from the sky which actually represents the signal from the cosmic objects and which are, uh, which are buried in the background noise which are produced by the uh, radio receivers. They are integrated and so with the time of integration increasing and the bandwidth increasing, the signal to noise ratio goes up uh, considerably. We do not have enough time to go into the details of this but this shows you what became possible uh, now with the new UGMRT bands and therefore we could go 10 times better in terms of sensitivity of the instrument and make it into a 2020 instrument rather than a 2000 era instrument. So in the next slide, uh, next slide you can see all the sophisticated electronics which was built in Pune for uh, wideband RF electronics, improved optical fiber systems. And these, all these telescopes were actually originally connected with optical fibers. And so now optical fibers were used to bring the total uh, radio frequency signal from the telescope itself down to the central, uh, central building and then process them uh, right there. And which is, uh, uh, which is uh, many, many advantages. So the, one had to build, uh, uh, build various uh, things, but you could see absorption lines and other things as shown in this uh, central graph, uh, very beautifully with very high signal to noise ratio. And therefore you could discover new pulsars, you could discover uh, many new radio galaxies and uh, radio galaxy surveys were done, objects uh, were seen, new objects were seen, new pulsars could be discovered 
and many new things could be done. In the next slides, I think we'll go through a few things rapidly. So the original GMRD instrument measured in terms of a uh, millionth of a Jansky. Now, uh, Divorgia told me at some time that I should explain what is a Jansky. A Jansky is a unit of flux, uh, which is uh, used by radio astronomers. And it is named after Carl Jansky, uh, who was the original discoverer of uh, radio waves from the sky. And Jansky is an extremely minute signal. It is one multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 26 watts per square meter per hertz. It is a hundred trillionth trillionth of a watt. That is what the astronomers measures, measure. And when you measure, uh, when you measure the sun, of course, you get, uh, you know, you get uh, plenty of signals uh, still. But when you measure these weak radio sources, you don't measure it in terms of even Jansky these days. You measure it in terms of millijansky or microjansky, which is uh, 10 to the power of minus 32 and microjansky, minus 32 watts. So it is phenomenally weak signals which are being used to discover just as a Hubble telescope observes the sky and discovers new objects. Which, because of its sensitivity and because it is in space. Similarly, GMRB discovers objects in the sky with a much higher sensitivity for observing. And so this one shows uh, a 32 megahertz bandwidth at the left-hand side picture, which is 350 microjansky sensitivity to the upgraded GMRB, which is 200 megahertz bandwidth and which gives 28 microjansky, so which is more than 10 times this. So one could detect radio galaxies in the Goma cluster, some for the first time. And so this was done by uh, Dharamir Lal and Ishwar Chandra, and these results have been published uh, very recently. And the next slide, we, we saw probably pulsars. Yeah, pulsars. Now there's very significant potential for discoveries of new pulsars. I call this, call GMRD a true pulsar machine. It should be used heavily for pulsar discovery. And so this has discovered a uh, 0.5 millijansky sensitivity level pulsar uh, recently. So this is a 2017, uh, 2017 picture. And so uh, now the uh, GMRT is poised for many new things till uh, the big uh, radio telescope called the Square Kilometer Array comes. Uh, GMRT will remain for another probably five to 10 years. It will remain as a most front ranking instrument below 1400 megahertz uh, for astronomical, radio astronomical observations. So in the next slide, the usage statistics, as you can see, GMRD is again a very unique instrument in that more than 50 countries are participating in making observations using GMRD. There's a huge list of countries from Argentina to United States, which of course is a large percentage as you can see in this pie diagram. India takes about 48% of the time and the rest of the time is, so in a sense, majority of the time is used by uh, countries from abroad for doing uh, front ranking astrophysical uh, studies. Uh, in the next slide, uh, yes, I, I just want to dwell on this for one minute. So the question arose uh, when we were uh, space ISRO was launching various uh, uh, probes to the moon, Chandrayaan, and then Mangalyaan, and various such things, they needed a, a deep space tracking antenna. So the question arose whether this can be built in the country or whether this is be important. And several of us, including me, pointed out to them that uh, it should be certainly built in India. And so finally, this was built in India by the ISRO team, along with uh, Electronics Corporation of India Limited, 
by this time our project manager had retired and joined uh, he was uh, requested to join the electronics corporation and help in uh, making this antenna in ecil and this antenna was uh, erected in 2011 in a place called bailalu and this is a deep space antenna which is used regularly for tracking isro's moon mars missions and in the next slide is so show how gmrt itself can be used for uh, providing support to the space probes so gmrt was used for a ground support for exo mars mission of uh, european space agency and uh, gmrt and nasa uh, collaborated in tracking objects and gmrt faithfully tracked the shiaparelli lander module of exo mars through what is called the eight minutes of hell like isro said about five minutes of hell this was also the descent uh, entry descent landing uh, detection at gmrt on 19th of uh, october 2016 so this picture actually shows that so this is the practical use to which such large uh, arrays can be used in a phased array mode where you can combine several antennas together Uh, to form one single aperture for tracking objects uh, with very high sensitivity and uh, therefore uh, you can combine for example uh, the bailalu uh, telescope and gmrt to keep tracking objects space probes in the sky and i hope that it will be used uh, much more in in future for such purposes so there is a utility for these purely astronomical instruments for serving the purpose of the nation too so we have come a long way in radio astronomy research uh, to put all these things together now india is a very leading partner in the mother of all radio telescopes the square kilometer array south africa's karu will host the core of the high and mid frequency dishes ultimately extending over the african continent so this array is going to extend over a continent not over 25 kilometers but over 3000 kilometers and similarly australia's murchison shire will host the low frequency antennas which will again extend up to uh, fiji and uh, tasmania and new zealand and all these places so gmrt team are leading the work on control and monitor system and the square kilometer array will host thousands of dish antennas and billions of low frequency antennas and that will be the world's most sensitive radio telescope for the next 50 years and the first phase of this is uh, expected to uh, come up by about 2025 or so and uh, of course as the years roll by and the plans uh, don't get uh, implemented the costs are going up but nevertheless i think this car will be a reality uh, one of these days and so the the new scholars who are there in uh, jbns theories if they want to get into very exciting astronomy they can get into gmrt first and then graduate to sk later because uh, very good training is required for this purpose and these are complex instruments very complex instruments very sophisticated instruments and handling uh, beginning to handle petabytes of data you know and soon exabytes of data from uh, from these uh, very sophisticated instrument and so astronomy is becoming a global partnership of nations uh, where each is collaborating with the other and providing help and technology know how and front ranking electronics absolutely front ranking electronics you know and so therefore it, it amazes me sometimes how much of progress uh, we have been able to make and how much of progress is going on in the world in these things to just catch up with these things and uh, catch up with these developments and remain at the forefront is a task by itself and india should rise up to the occasion and be able to do such things and that is in the future in the hands of uh, youngsters like the jb nasty scholars and various other uh, competent engineers and scientists in the country
So that is the radio astronomy of the future. And I thank you very much for being there for this talk. And I'm very sorry for the amount of time I have taken. <laughs> sorry. Over to Devargya. Thank you so much, Anantada, uh, for, for uh, describing so beautifully about the, the details. Like I, I did not have pretty much any knowledge of radio astronomy. Um, maybe well, you did that, a great job. This is very useful for me. So <laughs> and I, I'm sure and I hope it has been very uh, you know, educative for many other participants here just the basic radio astronomy by itself and how India has contributed over the years and is a leader right now. Uh, we are definitely, we have exceeded our expectations of the of how much time will take, but it's fine. That's also how Tesla works, but they are uh, one of the leading car companies today in the world. Um, you know, if, if there are some questions specifically, uh, scientific questions related to this talk for uh, Professor Anand Krishnan, would you like to mention that in the chat box? We can probably streamline the the questions that way that way better. Yeah, I would very much welcome. I would very much welcome questions because uh, if you don't ask me anything, I have to assume either that you have understood it too well or that you have not understood at all and you have no doubts and everything is uh, either above your head. Enjoyed oh. it very much. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, you. <laughs> very, very exciting. Thank you. We are there. <laughs> yes, it was an exciting journey. Are. It was a very exciting, exciting journey. 40, 50 Starting years. This is the whole thing. That is really something. <laughs> and I'm sorry to hear about Dr. Uh, uh, Govind Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, he was uh, he was a quintessential nationalist, fierce nationalist. And uh, but on the other hand, he was a front-ranking electronics engineer, come physicist, come astronomer, come mechanical engineer, come electrical engineer, <laughs> everything. The only thing which he said always that uh, he regretted was not undertaking a graduate course in computer engineering. <laughs> so there is, a, sorry, Professor. Very so, modest um, no, sorry. Thank uh, you, there is a Thank question. you, Thank you, Papi Ma'am, for joining. We are very happy that you're here. Uh, Dr. Anjan Ghosh has a question. If you, if yes. uh, Anantada can, can say something about super optical telescopes in, in India in future. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a great question. Uh, in fact, I was very much involved in uh, I, the installation and commissioning of the large 3.6 meter optical telescope in Aries uh, in uh, 2015 to 2018 or something like that. I was involved in it from 2007, but Anyway, uh, I was in the project board, and we had a we had a number of very good uh, people from India. Uh, the difficulty is, uh, let me tell you that the difficulty is the tradition. We did not build up a tradition of making optical telescopes in the country uh, since uh, Venu Babu built. Doctor Venu Babu was a famous uh, optical astronomer. He built the Kavalur radio telescope, two point, <laughs> the optical telescope, 2.34 meter optical telescope. In fact, Rajiv Gandhi, uh, in his uh, days as prime minister, he went to inaugurate it and he sat at the prime focus there on the telescope. And that was a great progress. And since then, we simply did not uh, progress further. Now, uh, uh, the only way we could build GMRT was because we had gone through the mill of uh, UTI telescope, then tried to build the UTI synthesis radio telescope, then planned for the giant equatorial radio telescope, and then planned for very long baseline array interferometers and things like that. And so we gained experience. We are like artisans. Yeah. You know, I mean, you don't become a welder or a turner or 
uh, lathe machine operator uh, overnight. You know, if you are in Caltech, for example, they tell you to go to the milling machine and learn milling. And our students, when they go from India to Caltech, they get completely flummoxed. <laughs> Uh, so what is all this? I have never seen this stuff in, in India before. So this is what we have to train our graduates to do. So as a result, we have great difficulty in building an optical telescope in India by ourselves. We don't have the technology of uh, mirror making. So what we have done instead is to participate in the 30 meter optical telescope, which is being built by Caltech. They're trying to build, there's a lot of resistance from the Hawaii and uh, original people to put it on the uh, Mauna Kea site. And, uh, but they're still, I think they will work out finally. Uh, so India is a participant in that, a 10% participant in that. And so India is uh, doing, uh, making mirrors, uh, mirror surfaces in a, in a plant in, uh, built for this purpose by Indian Institute of Astrophysics in, uh, in Bangalore. And it is, uh, that is coming up and they have tried to make, and the final shape is given back in, uh, I think in a factory in, in the United States. We have not reached that level of sophistication. We don't have, uh, uh, we don't have sophisticated uh, 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 engineering uh, places here in India for this purpose, a large mirror making. Uh, although a 30 meter mirror is not a single 30 meter mirror, it consists of about 1.35 meter, several mirrors of 1.35 uh, meters in diameter and put together and computer controlled so that it becomes one parabolic dish, uh, mirror dish, just like GMRT dish. Right. That is yet to come. and. Again, we need scientists who become technologists and who can take up such uh, challenging projects and who can build this, uh, build such instruments in India. Similarly, for uh, building a solar telescope, we cannot handle when the sun uh, energy is concentrated together, it heats up the whole bloody mirror system and it will warp the mirror in no time. Yes. So how do you cool? How do you cool the signal? You have to learn the heat and thermodynamics of this. A very complicated thing because I was the chairman of the project board for a national large solar telescope, only two meters. Okay, the largest which has been made is by uh, in the United States, which is uh, now called by a Japanese name. Sorry, it is uh, it is a large optical telescope of four meters, but a solar telescope. Okay, which has become operational now. Right. So to graduate into these things, you need extreme precision engineering and people who are trained to imagine about such things and build it up from basic physics and convert that into technology and do it. You know? right. uh, in radio is uh, relatively easy in comparison because we are dealing with large wavelengths. Mm -hmm. But in optical, high precision is required. It is like making an atomic force microscope. Right. Well, not very easy. <laughs> you know, although we could have done these things. So I think in, in, in opening up the economy and all that in the 1980s, we did a grave injustice to our own country. We forgot to learn uh, basic things by ourselves. Till then, there were physics departments in this country where microscopes were being built. Uh, various people were trying various spectroscopy experiments and people were trying to build at least laboratory level. Now we are talking in terms of industrial level. So if you don't know how to build even prototypes, how can you build uh, giant instruments? You know, that is the answer. <laughs> so I guess some, some JV scholar several years from now will be talking in a positive light about this. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. We need to do so many things in so many aspects of science in optical fiber communication, for example, you know, people are doing fantastic jobs. Orbital angular momentum work is going on <laughs> now. Fantastic things are being done even in your own place, Boston, <laughs> you know, 
uh, there is a guy, uh, Siddharth Ramachandran, who is a professor at uh, Boston University. He is working on uh, three-dimensional communication. <laughs> you know, multiple level communication, so you can support huge number of uh, communication channels. A thousand communication channels in one go. <laughs> so things like that. We, we need to increase our technology press, basically. Right. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Thank Sorry. you so much. I just want to end with one thought. One of the slides, like all of this was very enlightening. One slide specifically where you showed the image of the distant galaxies, uh, yes. you know, several, several uh, megaparsecs uh, away, which essentially translate to like 60, 70 light years, uh, 60, 70 million light million years. Million light years, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's just, you know, humankind on earth has been here for like, uh, six million years or so. So essentially, we are re receiving photons which have been generated uh, like ten times oh, before yes. that, and that's that's some you know that's on right. a philosophical level. I think that's very uh, uh, you know very um, thrilling to to, to feel. Absolutely, Divorga, you should have seen this video which is circulating in the WhatsApp of uh, how Earth looks like from Saturn. Yeah, okay. It is a small dot on this, you know. So one thing is to be uh, very humble about what we know of this cosmos. But second thing is to marvel, marvel like uh, Carl Sagan, that sitting on this tiny earth, we are able to imagine all this and think mm -hmm. of 13.6 light, billion light years away to the cosmic dawn and the dark energy and the dark matter and the black holes and all that, <laughs> you see. Yeah. That is what is fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you once again, Professor Anand Krishnan. And yeah. we'll definitely be in touch. And for all of the other members of JVNSTS, we also have other events lined up. So please keep yeah. an eye out for them. And we hope to see you again in the near future. And sure. everyone have a good day. And uh, see you again soon.